this episode of Travelog, I'm escaping to the misty hills and bamboo forests of Yibin in southwest China. There, I'll discover how the area was once a sanctuary for the intelligentsia. It's been famously said that the road to Sichuan is more difficult than climbing into the sky. But it's because of its very inaccessibility that Sichuan became a safe haven for people and traditions on the verge of extinction. And nowhere is this more true than here in Yibin. The city of Yibin is located in the subtropical south of Sichuan province. Located within a fertile basin, Yibin lies at the highest navigable point on the Yangtze River. That side of the river is noticeably faster, isn't it? So you've probably heard of the Yangtze, it's the third longest river in the world. But here in China, the Yangtze actually has many names. And right now, I'm at the confluence of the Min River and the fast-flowing Jinsha River over there. And it's here that the Yangtze actually becomes the Yangtze. So a lot of people call this town the first town on the Yangtze River. The prevalence of dock workers in Yibin gave rise to a kind of wharf culture, which has even influenced the city's cuisine. Quite like the uh, laid-back feel of this place, really. The roads are narrower, the terrain is, you know, hillier, more diverse. But uh, you know what they say, the best way to get to know a place is through its food. And I know that Yibin is famous for its burning noodles, just gonna go find a good noodle shop. I'm heading to meet someone who's a master chef when it comes to preparing burning noodles. All right, let's put the bun in burning noodles. Yeah. Oh my word. <laughs> Can you believe that? These noodles are literally on fire. They're literally burning. Now for the real taste test. Oh, very nutty. It's really al dente. Like, almost almost rare, like medium, medium well. I'm quite surprised because there's so many different kinds of oils in there, but it actually doesn't taste oily at all. Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. The upper reaches of the Yangtze were notoriously difficult to navigate. To complete their journeys, boats employed towmen, who would physically drag the boats ashore. These gut-busting noodles gave the workers a much-needed calorie boost. Hard work calls for hard liquor, and it just so happens that Yibin's warm, moist climate is perfect for fermentation. Oh, wow. Isn't that the biggest bottle of booze you've ever seen? No way we'd miss this place. So uh, we've come to the headquarters of Wu Liangye, who are China's biggest producer of baijiu, and they're famous for their incredibly strong, incredibly fragrant spirits. Meaning clear liquor, baijiu is China's alcoholic drink of choice. It's made by fermenting and distilling grains. And at Wuliangye, they use five different grains. But the secret to their success lies in their fermentation pits. They've been using the same ones since the Ming Dynasty. It's a bit like having a 600-year-old sourdough starter. It's the rich ecosystem of microorganisms in those pits that gives Wu Liangye its distinct flavour. All right, a spirit over 600 years in the making. 
Oh, oh my word, that packs a punch, but not, not in a bad way, not in a bad way. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know, you know when they say something's a flavour bomb, that is like a flavour napalm, oh my word, it's burning all the way from my throat down my chest and, and kind of like just setting my stomach alive, but it's so incredibly full of flavour. <laughs> oh, that is good. My thirst quenched, I'm off to visit another of Yibin's famous attractions. Well, here we are. I'm in the upper reaches of the Yangtze River at a place called Li Zhuang, which during World War II, when Japan invaded China, was a place where many of China's top scholars and literati sought refuge and they brought with them their knowledge, their expertise, even universities, which turned this formerly sleepy little backwater town into one of China's most important cultural centers. At first glance, Li Zhuang's old quarters belie its illustrious past. All the shops appear to be shut, but perhaps their owners are just out playing mahjong. After all, the Sichuanese are famous in China for being laid back. It's as if no matter what life throws at them, there's always time for tea and a game of cards. During World War II, when Li Zhuang was a safe haven from the Japanese, some of China's finest academic institutions relocated here, as well as a number of the country's leading intellectuals. come to the former abode of two of modern China's brightest stars, Lin Huiyin and Liang Sicheng. They were a husband and wife team who dedicated their entire lives to the study and more importantly, the documentation of traditional Chinese architecture. The two studied together at the University of Pennsylvania. Upon their return to China, they founded one of this country's first schools of architecture. There are many ancient buildings here in China, but the people who built them were often illiterate. They were masters of their craft, but they left behind no written records of their techniques. And so what Liang Sicheng and Lin Huiyin did was uncover these ancient secrets and in that process introduced the modern study of architecture to China. They did this while on the run from war, moving with their children from city to city, before eventually arriving in Lidong, more than 2,000 kilometers away from their home in Beijing. They did this at great cost to themselves. The living conditions here were poor, to say the least, and Lin Huiyin was dying of tuberculosis. They could have fled abroad, away from the war, where her TB might have been cured, but they felt that their life's mission was more important, to save Chinese architecture. Coming up next, we'll explore the wonderful world of bamboo before delving into the subterranean world beneath our feet. I'm heading to Shunan Zhuhai, which literally translates as Bamboo Sea. Part of the blockbuster movie Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon was filmed in this vast bamboo forest. And I've decided to stay overnight for the full experience. Oh, there goes my itinerary. Was uh, planning on visiting the bamboo forest today, but 
doesn't look like that's happening anytime soon. Who needs an itinerary anyway? The whole point is to just come here. This is the itinerary. I'm staying at the Zhuan Yinsuo Hotel. Like many of the boutique hotels here, it's located inside the bamboo forest. It's the perfect escape for burned out city folk like myself to get back to nature and enjoy some quality time off the grid. That was wonderful. Oh, I love this little Zen garden. Wish I had one at home. Just these bamboo fences and this little replica of Mother Nature in front of me. Just wonderful. And all this fresh air, the smell and sound of rain. Can't beat it. But got to get on with the rest of the day. Ah, oh, time to go. across 120 square kilometers, roughly the size of Disney World Florida. This is what it's uh, like to be lost in a bamboo forest, hey? Oop. <laughs> Quite slippery here. I actually read that uh, a third of all bamboo is found in China, and the uh, bamboo is probably the favorite plant of Chinese people. They represent all sorts of things. Um, virtue, the deep roots of the bamboo represent resoluteness, tenacity, the long, tall, upright stems, honor, and um, the hollow interior, modesty. And when you look at the bamboo standing by itself, it's also incredibly elegant. And that's why, for Chinese people, the bamboo is the gentleman of plants. Though the stem of bamboo is rigid, its tip is flexible the perfect metaphor for knowing when to go with the flow. It's quite hard to sum up Chinese people's love for the bamboo, but these guys are a very good example. These are the seven sages of the bamboo grove, and they were real people who lived around about 1,700 years ago during a time of conflict and political turmoil, and they very famously would often gather in a bamboo grove and you know, drink lots of wine, uh, play music, do poetry, and just generally sort of extol the virtues of a simpler way of life. And I think for a lot of people, when they come to a bamboo forest like this, it's sort of like a temporary respite from the pressures and stress of real life and a way to cleanse the mind, body, and soul, if only for just a little while. For over 7,000 years, the Chinese have used bamboo to make everything from furniture to houses, tools, and even clothing. <laughs> Look at all this. Uh, came out for a stroll, bumped into a really happening market. A lot of stuff I've never even seen before. I've made bamboo shoots before at home, but never seen them actually fresh in their local environment. And this sort of thing, this is uh, some kind of bamboo fungus. I've had it before. It's really soft, quite spongy. Everyone's using, but they're either eating bamboo or they're using it. They're carrying, you know, these bamboo baskets on their back. The market only convenes here on set days of the month. The vendors are all locals living in the bamboo forest. Many of them go foraging for produce, a lot of which ends up in specialty restaurants. And bamboo is such a versatile material. You can pretty much build anything out of it. Plus, you can eat it too. Uh, apparently, there are over 200 different ways to eat bamboo. And that's why I've come here for the bamboo feast. Chef Li Tiang sources his ingredients from the forest, using the humble bamboo to create a kaleidoscope of dishes and flavors. Oh. Oh. He's lost me with the names of so many exotic ingredients. 
All I know is they're precious and very tasty. In fact, bamboo mushrooms used to be sent as tribute to the imperial court. They were also served at a state banquet for Henry Kissinger. I really am receiving the VIP treatment. This is really the bounty of the bamboo, isn't it? So many different kinds of textures, so many different kinds of fungus, all of them edible. Don't even really need to eat meat. You can still eat like a king. Here we go. Crunchy, lively, delicate, the list of adjectives is endless. My next stop is Seungwon County, home to the curiously named Stone Sea. Wow. Doesn't it look like, a, like the surface of the moon over here? Uh, I've come to a UNESCO World Geopark here in Seungwen, and all of these stones around me are what's part of something called cast topography, but together here they form something really special, a limestone pavement. To me, they look like rows of shark's teeth. All of these weird and wonderful shapes around me were formed through thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years of erosion by water. And even now, I can still see a little stream just over there working its magic on all this soluble rock. On many of these ancient stones, you'll find strange growths. This is called a chert, a kind of rock that's often formed of the petrified remains of tiny ocean critters. Oh. So you might be wondering how this place formed. Maybe it was a, a mountain or a plateau or something. But actually, more than 200 million years ago, this entire area used to be the bottom of an ocean. And so this right now is a seabed. And obviously where there's seabed, there's fossils. And that's why if you look really closely, you'll be able to find some ancient coral like these guys on many of the rocks here. But that's not all. This geopark is filled with surprises. Whoa! Oh my word. You know, I've seen sinkholes before, but it really is a different feeling to be at this level, to pretty much be amongst the clouds. But this was the first sinkhole to be discovered and explored here in China. It's over 200 meters deep, and it really is just quite otherworldly, isn't it? The sinkhole formed when an underground river hollowed out the inside of a limestone mountain, causing it to collapse in on itself. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, this place is incredible. I love caves. And the best thing is, like, this is just a tiny part of it. The rest of the cave is right down there. <laughs> so, normally, people would just walk down. But why walk down when you can slide down in style? <laughs> Here we go, we can be like... Whee! Oh, this is kind of fun. Definitely a good way to see the cave in style. Ooh, Ooh ow! <laughs> oh, wow, it looks amazing down there. Ooh, oh, ow! <laughs> <laughs> this is one of China's largest cave systems. I get goosebumps knowing that I'm walking through the bowels of the earth, and not just because it's colder down here. This is another world, right beneath our feet, where palaces of stone form over the course of millions of years. These are the sculptures of time. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's a work of art of Mother Nature. But 
I guess we're also witnessing the flow of time. And especially when you're here in this cave, you kind of realize that all your troubles and your worries, they're totally insignificant. Because at the end of the day, we barely even register as a blip on the radar. Coming up next, we'll visit an ancient graveyard with a view before trying the unusual yet delicious local street food. Oh, heaven, man. I'm heading to another of Yibin's curiosities, this time in Gongxian County. I've come to a very mysterious place. There used to be a people called the Bo, who lived in this area, but they disappeared off the face of the earth roughly 500 years ago. All they left were their hanging coffins. So what I've come to see is right up there. The Boer were indigenous to Sichuan and Yunnan provinces. They had a strange tradition of removing their wisdom teeth, but they're best known for their cliff coffins. Some say the board did this because limestone isn't suitable for ground burials, while others say they did it to protect the deceased from wild animals. Each casket was carved out of a single log. They were meant to last for eternity. Inexplicable to us why the Boer people would place their dead in these hanging coffins, but for them it must have been common sense. I mean, these were people who lived on the tops of vertical cliffs. We bury our dead in graveyards and they bury theirs on cliffs. But I think maybe the more important takeaway is that the Boer people left no written records. They were literally wiped off the face of the earth. But by seeing how they died, we're able to open a very small window in history and see how they used to live. The Boer were a hardy people who lived on the tops of mountains out of reach of bandits. But they still had dealings with the outside world and would eventually be defeated by the imperial troops of the Ming dynasty. Man, we are having absolutely terrible weather, but still, I am currently surrounded by all these tea trees that cover up the entire hillside here. And apparently, during the time of the Boer people, these were given as tribute to the emperor, so they should be really, really good tea. This is a green tea. There are no written records, but legend has it that the Boer sent it as tribute to the imperial palace. It's a very clear, clean tea. Tastes like spring. The war are long gone, but many ethnic minorities still reside in this area. I bumped into a group of ethnic Miao singers. This gentleman is singing an improvised song. Wow. This is what you're singing. What's the name of the song? It's about the story of the story of the story. But I just want to sing the story of the story. Then I sing the story of the story. 
就是临时就是想才是这样的去对话。啊，看不上的时候就不知道。看不上，再见。It hasn't been easy for the Miao either. It's believed they were originally from the plains, but fled to the mountains due to being persecuted. Here they found safety and learned to thrive in their new environment. Every cloud has a silver lining. I've come to Sichuan to try their legendary street food. I'm told the things.